Well, I think we can get started. Uh, so my name is Sharon Hu. I'm a University of uh, Notre Dame. I'm one of the organizers of a workshop, which I will discuss briefly. So first I want to say uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to whoever or wherever you are in, around the world. Welcome to this um, uh, pilot talk series. And this pilot talk series is affiliated with the NSF workshop on processing in memory technology, or we call it PMT. Now this workshop is co-organized by Duke University, University of Notre Dame, TU Munich, Washington State University, George Mason University, and of course, a National Science Foundation at the United States. Now the idea of this workshop is to provide a forum for experts in the relevant research thrust of processing memory to especially uh, consider the new challenges and visions for uh, this really rapidly growing area. Uh, we focus specifically on circuits, architectures, systems, and the applications. The workshop will be held uh, physically, hopefully, in April of 2021. Now to get the community excited about the workshop and really understand the scope of the workshop, we decided to hold a, uh, what we call the pilot talk series, uh, where we invite experts from relevant research fields to give uh, talks about their related research. Uh, the, our first pilot talk was given by Professor Kaushik Roy at Purdue University. And today is our great pleasure to have the honor of the speaker for our second pilot talk, and will be given by Professor Ona Mutlu. And I think I'm just going to uh, introduce Professor uh, Ona Mutlu briefly. His uh, CV, I think, can take a um, number of pages. So I'll just highlight a great achievement that he has. Uh, Ona is a professor of computer science at ETH Zurich. He's also a faculty member at the C uh, Carnegie Mellon University. His uh, research interests, his current research interests, are in computer architecture, systems, hardware security, and bioinformatics. Now, he and his collaborators have invented a number of technologies that have been employed in commercial microprocessor and memory and storage systems. He got his PhD and master's degree in ECE from the University of Texas at Austin, and his bachelor's degree is from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. He has extensive research uh, and industry experience. He worked at Microsoft, Intel, AMD, and Google, etc. He has also received numerous awards and I just list a few here. They include Atropy Computer Society, Edward McCluskey Technical Achievement Award, ACMC Graph, Morris Wilkie's Award, uh, Atropy Computer Society Young Computer Architect Award, and the US National Science Foundation Career Award. Uh, he also received a number of best paper or top pick papers uh, recognized at various conferences. He's an ACM fellow, an Atropy fellow, and an elected member of the Academy of Europe. Now today, he's going to share with us uh, how to design intelligent architectures for intelligent machines, and especially focusing on handling or, or blending the boundary of memory and processing. So let's welcome Professor Mutlu, and I will give it to you, uh, Mutlu. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you very much, Sharon, for the uh, very generous introduction, and thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I think I'll just get started. Uh, okay, uh, so thanks for uh, coming to the talk. Uh, I'm, I'm quite excited that NSF is having this initiative on processing in memory. Uh, it's definitely a, a great topic for the future. Uh, so I'm going to talk about intelligent architectures for intelligent machines. Uh, this talk is titled this way, uh, mainly because I was act actually asked to give a keynote talk in, in an SRC event, the Semiconductor Research Corporation event, uh, a long while ago, 
actually actually it's been it's been about a year now and i was asked to provide my uh title for the talk but i was too late and and the event organizer decided that i should be talking about architectures for intelligent machines and i really like the title but i had to add intelligent uh, to the beginning of it because if you really want to design an architecture for an intelligent machine uh, it had better be intelligent in my opinion so i'm going to talk about uh, what that means from my perspective in this talk uh, and uh, hopefully we can uh, have some questions this talk is much longer than uh, the one hour that is dedicated to it, but we're going to skip some slides uh, so that we can cover uh, whatever is interesting. And if I'm running out of time, Sharon, feel free to uh, cut me off and uh, uh, we can take questions anytime. Okay, uh, so uh, today I think nobody disputes that computing is bottleneck by data. And for many important applications, uh, data they're all data intensive, AI, ML, genomics, uh, whatever you are really interested in, they're all becoming uh, either are very data intensive or going to be data intensive quickly into the future. And these applications require rapid and efficient processing of large amounts of data. And data is increasing on top of this. Basically, we can generate much more data than we can process today in many applications. These are some example applications that we have. Uh, some of these we, we know very well about, but the data set sizes are growing across the world. And data is a performance energy bottleneck and it overwhelms modern machines today. These are some other applications we have on the mobile end, but they're equally important. And there are many more edge applications that are also coming similar to these or even more stringent than these. And they consume a lot of data. And as a result, data becomes a performance energy bottleneck. And in some other applications that are uh, potentially even more exciting, depending on what you're working on, in genomics, for example, we can today sequence many, many more genomes than we can analyze. And as a result, uh, again, data is, it becomes a huge bottleneck. And this happens because uh, today's genome sequence analysis machines are actually very, very powerful. And uh, their, their costs in terms of uh, sequence genome per uh, dollar, let's say, or per, per byte uh, is uh, in, uh, reducing much faster than Moore's law has been reducing for decades and decades, as you can see with this graph. OK, today, basically, we can uh, sequence a lot of things, but we cannot analyze uh, the genome uh, very well uh, because uh, the analysis that we do are very much intensive on the data. And again, this is another application that I think is really important going into the future where data is a big, big performance energy bottleneck. And this is becoming even more important today if you uh, consider COVID-19 and understanding of it. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this uh, to motivate because I think these are some emerging applications that are very much bottleneck by data from the get-go. And I believe we really need to uh, re rethink the design of our systems to handle some of these applications. And this application, in this case, is, this, uh, is, is, is uh, motivated by this device, which is a long read sequencing technology, which you can hold in your hand, as you can see. And these are nanopore devices. And uh, these nanopore devices enable sequencing of many, many uh, genomes relatively quickly and, uh, uh, you, and relatively cheap. You can buy this device for $1,000. You can think of these as edge devices, if you will. There's a version of this where you can, uh, which you can attach to your phone as well. Uh, but the problem is, uh, even though you can sequence genomes relatively quickly, because uh, they, uh, you need to move the data somewhere else to process, uh, data becomes a performance energy bottleneck. And if you're really interested, we do a lot of work in this area, and this is a recent survey paper that we were invited to write in IEEE Micro. And this is a paper that we recently presented uh, at Micro Conference last week that talks about designing specialized accelerators for approximate string matching. And this turns out to be a near data accelerator, if you read the paper. Okay, so data essentially overwhelms modern machines today due to the workloads that we're seeing. And they, it overwhelms the storage and memory capability, communication capability, and in the end, computation capability as well. And on top of this, it greatly impacts robustness, energy, performance, and cost as well. So if you look at a computing system, for a long time, we've designed computing systems to be processor-centric, even though a computing system fundamentally has three components, computation, communication, and storage, and memory. We have heavily optimized the computing unit, and all data has to go to the computing unit to be processed. As a result, all of the other parts of the system are relatively ignored, and they're not intelligent, let's say. They cannot act on the data. And this is, the, uh, this is because of our processor-centric designs. And this is a picture that I had drawn uh, in about 2008, uh, when I was writing in my first proposal to NSF, actually, talking about multi-core systems. And the systems that we have today are still similar to this. Uh, but if you, I'm going to point out only one thing over here. Data processing happens only in the red components called cores here. Everything else is there to move and store data. And if you do the calculation, 
less than 5% of a node's uh, area, including everything else over here, as you can see in this picture, less than 5% is dedicated to computing units. Everything else is there to move and store data. And this is because of the processor-centric design paradigm that we have today. And we call these devices computing devices, but most of the area and most of the time and energy is really dedicated to data storage and movement. So maybe we should really be thinking something else, uh, so, uh, thinking about the paradigm change to enable real computing devices that do compute most of the time and that they dedicate most of their resources to actual computation as opposed to data storage and movement. Okay, so as a result, we have a picture that looks like this. Data becomes a performance energy bottleneck. On these workloads, we studied with Google and we found out that more than 60% of, uh, of the total system energy is spent on data movement. Okay, so I will start with this axiom. I will basically say that an intelligent architecture has to handle data well. And the question is, of course, how do you do that? And I believe there are three steps for this. First, we need to ensure that data does not overwhelm the components of the architecture by designing intelligent algorithms, intelligent architectures, and perhaps even more importantly, by designing whole system designs, algorithms, architectures, and devices that are all intelligent in terms of how they handle data, such that they don't let uh, data to overwhelm the components that we design. I'm going to talk a lot about this. I think this is going to lead into the data-centric computing paradigms that we're going to discuss a lot in this talk. Okay, second, we need to take advantage of vast amounts of data and metadata to improve architectural and system level decisions. And I think this is also very important because to, in today's systems that we design in hardware, uh, controllers see a lot of data and metadata and they make a lot of decisions based on that. But uh, in today's systems, they don't improve their policies based on the decisions that they make in the past and based on the rewards that they get and based on the quality of the decisions that they may figure out later on. And I think this is a big problem because if you think about intelligence, intelligence, in my opinion, uh, requires that you taking uh, advantage of your past decisions and improving based on them. For example, I'm a human being. Whenever I put my hand on a stove uh, that's hot, I quickly figure out that I should not do that again. If it's cold, no problem. But if it's hot, I don't do that. So I quickly distinguish in what state, what action I should take based on my past actions and based on what I've seen in my past actions. But if you look at a computer that looks like this, this is my cell phone, it doesn't matter what you look at. Uh, all of these things have memory controllers, for example, or cache controllers. And uh, the memory controller has seen uh, billions and billions of requests and different applications over the lifetime of, its, of my cell phone, let's say five years, which is true. Uh, but it has not adapted to anything it has seen, meaning in a given state, it's going to, ta it's going to take uh, the same action again, even though that action may have been wrong. Why? Because it's not intelligent enough. It, is not, it doesn't even realize that it made a wrong, wrong action. So I think this is going to be very important going into the future. An intelligent architecture requires intelligent controllers that can adapt to their decisions and over time change their policies. And I think this points out uh, to uh, designing machine learning based policies internally in the architectures. So I'm not going to talk as much about this in the talk. There is some section that's dedicated to it, but we'll probably skip it depending on how much time we have. That's why I wanted to talk to uh, talk about it a little bit more right now. And I think uh, the third part is uh, we need to understand and exploit properties of different data if you want an intelligent architecture that handles data well to improve the algorithms and architectures in various metrics. Uh, what do I mean by this? Today's architectures do not know much about what kind of data that they're dealing with because these, this information, the semantic information does not get communicated to the hardware. Whereas if we can distinguish the semantic information, for example, the security properties of data, the privacy properties of data, approximability properties of the data, compressibility properties of data, uh, many, many other properties, area vulnerability properties of the data, the architecture itself can make much more intelligent decisions. So the semantic gap uh, between the software and the architecture is really preventing us uh, from making intelligent decisions about different data and its different characteristics. Okay, so corollaries, I already talked about these corollaries very quickly, but uh, basically, if this is the architecture that we want based on the axiom that I mentioned, an intelligent architecture has to handle data well, today's architectures are not doing well. Basically, they're not good at dealing with data. As I mentioned, uh, they're mainly designed to store and move data versus to compute because they're processor-centric as opposed to data-centric. So we're gonna talk a lot about the data-centric paradigms as, we, as I discussed. And next, architectures are not good at taking advantage of vast uh, amounts of metadata and data available to them. They're still making the same decisions uh, that they were designed to make uh, uh, by a human. And as a result, they're making very simple decisions, ignoring lots of data 
And humans by nature cannot make very sophisticated decisions. We don't want to replicate the humans, I think, in my opinion. We want to do better than the humans in this case. So we really want to enable data-driven decisions in our controllers as opposed to human-driven decisions. And the third point is architectures today are terrible at knowing and exploiting different properties of application data. Uh, they're designed, as a result, they're designed to treat all data as the same. This is because they make component-aware decisions because they do not know about enough about data. So they cannot make data-aware decisions. And if we can communicate the higher-level semantic properties of the data well, we can do much better, in my opinion. So uh, I'm going to talk about these three, but I will focus on especially the first one over here, uh, data-centric architectures. So let's start with this one. I also call this memory-centric architectures. And if you want to list the properties of a data-centric architecture, I start with these four to begin with. First of all, I think we need to process the data where it resides, where it makes sense, while it's moving is also possible. I'm gonna talk a lot about this. Second, we need to respect data. And I think all of these properties go hand in hand, by the way. We need to respect data, meaning we need to enable low latency and low energy access to that data. And I think this is also very much important for processing data where it resides. Because if, you, if you're processing data where it resides and the memory is taking a very long latency, that's not good. On top of this, we need low cost data storage and processing, and there are many options available to us going forward and intelligent data management. We need intelligent controllers handling robustness, security, cost, privacy, et cetera, going into the future. I'm going to touch upon this a little bit to motivate, especially processing data where it resides. So let's jump into processing data where it resides or where it makes sense. In the more general form, it's really about where it makes sense. And I'm going to talk about processing in or near memory. And uh, I believe everyone <laughs> here, at least uh, uh, the, the older folks, know that this is a new, it's not a new idea, right? This is an old idea. And this is one of the earliest paper, uh, papers that were written in the area by Harold Stone. He did this work in the late 1960s, and he published this beautiful paper called Logic and Memory Computer. And this idea has been looked at many, many times in the past uh, 50 years, 50 plus years. Uh, but I believe today we're in a very special position where we were never constrained as we were before. And I think we may need to look, thing, look at things a little bit differently based on where we are today. Okay, what is that special position? I believe today, we're pushed very much from technology. Basically, uh, we've never been in a position where DRAM technology was uh, threatened as much. We didn't have as many scaling problems. And as a result, industry is today very much open to new memory architectures. And these are uh, non-volatile memories, could be some examples of this. I'm going to talk about that later briefly. But even in the DRAM space, uh, there are technologies like 3D stack memory technologies uh, that enable computation very much close to data in the logic layers underneath memory layers over here. And there are even experimental designs that people are looking into, as you can see, where you can do deterministic finite automaton computation uh, in row buffers. Okay, so this is uh, one motivation. That I'm going to talk about the system level motivation also, but let me cover the circuit level or device level scaling motivations quickly. Uh, and then we will talk about the higher level motivation uh, as well. So memory scaling has been a problem. And uh, clearly, if you're studying memory, uh, these are not new uh, to people. And this is a paper that I, I presented in my talk I had presented in the International Memory Workshop, uh, where we talked about memory scaling issues and say, we said that it's really critical to handle these issues in, with intelligent architectures going into the future. Uh, and we didn't have as much evidence about these issues, but we were collecting it at that time. So I'm going to talk about some of this evidence that require intelligent controllers uh, first. So basically, as memory scales to smaller technology nodes, it becomes unreliable. This is some data that we collected with Facebook. We analyzed all of the memory errors that they have in all of their data centers, which is a lot of memory and a lot of servers. And we found out that essentially, as chip density uh, becomes uh, higher, uh, then the, uh, the error rate of the server uh, increases. This is a correlational study, clearly. Uh, we, uh, we just report our observations. But basically, there's an intuition here. Uh, the intuition is that as chip density becomes higher, the cells are much more close to each other. As a result, they're more vulnerable to noise and they're less reliable. And this gets affected at the error reporting that happens in the server. So you get a lot of bit errors and then the servers either crash or you get uncorrectable errors or you get a lot of correctable errors that you need to somehow uh, deal with in some way uh, at the software level. Okay. So this is a large scale study. If you're really interested in, you can take a look at this paper for many other observations. But we also were very interested in studying the scaling issues, DRAM scaling issues at the uh, small scale as well. So we built this infrastructure. It's an FPGA based infrastructure to test uh, many different types of DRAM. And uh, we did a lot of work to study this. Uh, and this is one example of the infrastructure. This is one of the more recent examples of the infrastructure, as you can see over here. Uh, okay, something is happening, okay. 
uh, sorry about that. Uh, and we open source this infrastructure so people in industry and academia are actually using this infrastructure for various studies. So we built this infrastructure for retention time studies especially, but while we were doing these studies, we actually also found out that you can predictably induce errors in most DRM memory chips. We did this work collaboratively with Intel. Uh, and this is known as Rohammer today. And you can basically predictably induce bit flips in commodity DRM chips. And when we did the testing, more than 80% of the tested DRM chips were vulnerable to this effect. And this is really the first example of how a simple hardware failure mechanism, a bit flip, that you can create uh, leads to a widespread system security vulnerability. And as a result, folks in the relatively mainstream literature are writing papers or articles that, are, uh, that uh, sound like this. Forget software, now hackers are exploiting physics. And I think this is a very nice higher level characterization of Rohammer, as you will see in a little bit. So what is the problem? The problem is uh, essentially disturbance. And this is really nothing new to a, a memory technology because as any memory technology scales to smaller dimensions, whenever you do something on some cells, other cells get affected at, to some degree. Now, it turns out, in de uh, the question is, of course, should this be exposed to software? What we found in 2012, 2014 timeframe is these bit flips that happen in DRAM due to disturbance actually can get exposed to software. And this really should not happen because this breaks uh, the reliability guarantees and security guarantees that you have. So in DRAM, disturbance happens by whenever you activate a rope. When you activate a rope, uh, you open the row and apply high voltage to that word line. And then if you want to access some other row, you apply low voltage to this word line, you precharge the array essentially, uh, you lower the word line. Now, if you keep doing this repeatedly, activate, precharge, activate, precharge, activate, precharge, high voltage, low voltage, high voltage, low voltage, high voltage, low voltage, it turns out uh, uh, in existing DRAM uh, systems, DRAM chips, physically adjacent rows that, have, that contain vulnerable cells get bit flips in the vulnerable cells. Flip bits can, uh, these cells can flip from one to zero or zero to one, depending on how the encoding, but they essentially lose charge due to this repeated hammering of the rope, uh, because each repeated hammering actually causes some amount of charge leakage from these vulnerable cells. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but this is that we call this the hammered row, we call this the victim rows, and we showed that more than 80% of the chips that we tested at the time were vulnerable to this row hammer phenomenon, and it can actually predictably induce these bit flips if you know what you're doing. And this is a scaling problem because the cells, uh, the, the, the memory chips that we tested that were manufactured before 2010 were not vulnerable to this problem. This, the problem started happening in 2010 and all of the chips that we tested that, uh, that were manufactured in 2012 and 2013 were actually vulnerable. And as, essentially, we were able to induce enough activates at some point to cause these bit flips before the cells get refreshed. And that happened around 2010. And today, actually, we can induce a lot of activates in a DRAM chip within a refresh interval. So we, uh, the Rohammer is actually getting worse as, we will, as I will describe very, uh, very quickly uh, in the next few slides. So uh, what is worse about this is uh, when we actually wrote the paper, we said that memory isolation is a key property of a reliable and secure computing system and access to one memory address should not have unintended side effects on data stored and other addresses. And I still believe this, I think it's very fundamental. And we said that somebody can actually hijack the system using by uh, taking advantage of these bit flips. And while we were, we were working on that, uh, these good folks from Google Project Zero published a blog post showing exactly that. They basically showed that they could take advantage of these bit flips to take over uh, a, an x 64 Linux system with a user level process uh, where you don't have any privileges and there are no software bugs. Uh, you're just taking advantage of these bit flips so that you can circumvent uh, the memory isolation, memory protections. And this is a beautiful blog post that I would recommend to anybody because I think this has a lot of implications on processing in memory technology going into the future as well, because if you get bit flips like this in your processing in memory technology, uh, then your privacy and security are clearly at risk uh, going into the future. And these folks show that with a single bit flip that's, uh, repeated, uh, that's, that's repeatable, like Rohammer bit flips are, uh, they could uh, uh, do very beautiful uh, software uh, security engineering tricks to ensure that that bit flip lands on uh, protection bits, for example, uh, that give you, give you access to your own page tables. And these folks were able to bit, uh, flip bits in your own page tables such that they could gain access, write access to the user level process page tables. And once you can get write access to your own page tables, all bits are off essentially. So it's beautiful security engineering and there's a lot of work in Rohammer that I will very briefly mention later on. But to solve the problem, essentially, you need intelligent controllers. Somehow, at least some minimal uh, level of intelligence that ensures that 
uh, your, uh, your controller is cognizant of this problem and it can actually fix these problems. And I actually believe that you need more patchable and programmable controllers going into the future so that uh, if you catch this sort of problems in the field, you can fix them uh, relatively easily. Okay, so if you're interested, you can read uh, this work that, we, uh, that started all of this in Rowhammer. And we recently wrote a retrospective paper that covers uh, all the way from circuit level and device level issues in Rowhammer to security issues and software issues. If you're interested, you can take a look at that. But this is not the most up-to-date work. So we recently uh, done some works and also other, others have done, uh, done some works in, in Rowhammer in 2020. I'm gonna very briefly talk about two papers very quickly. Basically, this is not uh, getting better. This is getting worse actually. So in this work, we've tested more than 1500 DRAM chips and we showed that Rowhammer is getting much worse in newer technology nodes. You can actually induce Rowhammer bit flips after 4,800 double-sided hammers. This number was 139,000 in 2014. And chips are actually much more vulnerable going into the future. And existing mitigation mechanisms are not effective. They either cause, they're either not scalable to smaller values like this, or uh, they, uh, they, they have very high performance overheads. So basically we need much more intelligent controllers to actually solve this problem going to the future. And that will motivate processing in memory, processing near data. And I believe these reliability issues uh, and memory management issues are also very important to process near data or in memory. Okay, this work also show, uh, this is another work that I briefly I'm going to mention showing that Rohammer issues are not solved. Uh, this work showed that uh, you could actually circumvent uh, the mitigations that are put into DRAM chips by three major memory manufacturers. And these mitigations are advertised to be completely Rohammer free, but they're essentially not Rohammer free. Basically, an intelligent attacker can figure out how to attack these chips uh, to prevent, uh, to, to actually cause Rohammer bit flips and take over the system. So uh, the takeaway over here is that we really need uh, secure solutions to these bit flip problems. Okay, and I'm not gonna talk about this work, but basically this work uh, asked the question, can you actually uh, rate a chip to be Rohammer free? And I think the answer at this point is no, we don't have good enough methodologies for this. Okay, so I think uh, this points out to the push for circuits and devices. We need intelligent controls to handle this sort of scaling issues. And I don't think Rohammer is the only scaling issue. In fact, the reason why we started looking into uh, DEM a lot is because of refresh. And data retention, in my opinion, is an even more fundamental scaling issue with DRAM. Uh, and we wanted to get rid of refresh as much as possible so that we wanted to get rid of the overhead of refresh in systems like energy overhead, performance overhead, quality of service overhead. And to be able to do that, you actually need an intelligent controller. And I'm not going to talk about the work that we've done. There's a lot of characterization work, a lot of idea work that went into these papers that I'm flashing at you at this point. But suffice it to say that we really need intelligent controllers to get rid of refresh as much as possible. Uh, and I think getting rid of refresh is really important uh, so that we can make some of the technologies much more scalable going into the future. And I'm happy to talk about this. This is also a fascinating topic in my opinion. Okay, uh, it's not just us who are talking about these scaling issues and the scaling issues requiring intelligent memory controllers. I like this paper This is written by Samsung and Intel who at the time were not really talking to each other in my opinion, but they were nice enough to write this paper to the workshop that we organized in ISCA 2014. And they basically essentially said, DRAM process scaling is getting much worse and refresh variable retention time are key issues, write latencies are increasing. So we need some intelligence in the memory controllers so that we can co-architect controllers and DRAM such that we can overcome some of these issues. Okay, so that gives you a lower level perspective push from technology. I think we're being pushed from technology today very hard uh, to levels that we have not seen before. DRAM technology is seeing these scaling issues. So I think intelligent controllers would be very useful going into the future. Uh, and I think uh, flash technology is an example of where we have intelligent controllers, for example, handling a lot of these management issues. And on top of this, I think we have emerging memory technologies like non-volatile memory that can enable new opportunities. But let me give you the systems level perspective as well, because we're kind of squeezed in the middle. And I think that's why we need in-memory computation and change of a paradigm today. So system level issues in one slide, data access today is a major bottleneck. As I mentioned, applications are increasingly data hungry. Energy consumption is a key limiter. And data movement energy dominates compute energy today, especially true for off-chip to on-chip movement. So I'm gonna cover uh, this in a little bit more detail. But basically, in my view, the question is this. Do we want a world that looks like this? Very sustainable, very energy efficient, beautiful, that we all would like to live in? Or a world that looks like this? Very productive potentially, but a terrible place to live in and maybe just a world that can get destroyed 
because of our irresponsibility potentially. I would argue that we want the best of all worlds. We want high productivity, high performance, but also energy efficient and sustainable. The question is how do we get there? So the problem today is in many systems, data access is the major performance energy bottleneck. And our current design principles great, uh, cause great energy waste uh, because we move data all around the system uh, and all around the world. This is true for the micro scale as well as the macro scale. We're moving data to the data centers from the edge devices, uh, like the nanopore devices that I showed you, because they don't have the computation capability to answer the questions that we like them to answer. We're moving data within a processor chip all the way to the processor. As a result, we're causing a lot of energy waste. We're also causing a lot of performance loss. I put this in parentheses because we actually try very, very hard to overcome this performance loss. Clearly, we know that the data access is higher latency, uh, consumes high bandwidth, and we design our systems to be very, very complex to overcome that high latency. Uh, to, we add uh, a lot of uh, nice ideas like multi-threading, massive multi-threading, out of order execution, many, many levels of prefetching, many, many levels of caching and sophisticated management algorithms, which in the end try to overlap the performance loss a little bit. And they're use, uh, useful whenever they work, but they exacerbate the energy waste and they make our systems much more complex. So we're in a vicious cycle today. Uh, data access to memory and uh, the other parts of the system is long latency and high energy. And we're trying to tolerate the long latency part with even more energy and complexity. As a result, we're in this vicious cycle where we, we keep on increasing the energy consumption of our devices, especially when these techniques are not very effective. So I think whenever you're in a vicious cycle, it's good to understand where the problem is really coming from. And I think the problem is really coming from the fact that data processing of data is performed far away from the data. If we can break this, then we can get out of this vicious cycle. And we're back to this picture that I showed you because we're very processor centric, uh, because uh, the data storage units are dumb and largely unoptimized. As a result, we're, uh, we, we're having this problem with energy and performance and reliability as well, in my opinion. But we know very well that it's, uh, memory is a huge bottleneck. This is a quote from Dick Seitz, who wrote this one page article in Microprocessor Report after his team uh, designed one of the fastest processors of its time, the Alpha Processor. Uh, he was a chief architect. And he basically said, it's the memory stupid, playing with the election uh, uh, buzzwords at the time in the United States. Uh, basically, he said that we designed this processor to finish four instructions per cycle, but it's finishing one instruction every approximately five cycles, let's say. So it's operating at 120th of its peak bandwidth, instruction bandwidth. Why? It's waiting for data to come back in this important database workload. And he basically finishes his article saying that I expect that over the coming decade, memory subsystem design will be the only important design issue for microprocessors. And I agree with him. You can see that his emphasis in this only over here. Uh, so, okay, 10 years later, we did a similar study. This is based on my PhD dissertation, which was published in HPCA here, as you can see. We did this work together with Intel. We analyzed all of the workloads that they used to design their processors with, general purpose processors with, and we found out that most of the time, the processor is waiting for data. You can see that more than 50% of the time over here. Okay, you don't believe me, you don't believe the excites, you can read the paper if you're interested. Uh, but uh, since everybody believes Google these days, this is data from Google, uh, published in ISCA 2015, a beautiful paper, where they analyzed all of their data center workloads, according to them, and they basically show the same thing. Most of the time, this state-of-the-art Intel processor, Skylake, is waiting for data to come back from memory, and it's doing useful work, finishing instructions, only 10 to 20% of its time. Okay. You can see more analysis in their paper. So basically, we have this because we have a processor-centric design. We design grossly imbalanced systems because processing is done in only one place. Everything else stores and moves data. This is energy inefficient, low performance, and complex. And as a result, this is, in my opinion, is a data movement and storage system as opposed to a computing system. And we have an overly complex and bloated processor as well as accelerators to tolerate data access from memory. And this leads to even more energy inefficiency, complexity, and low performance. Uh, even when these mechanisms are useful, because we could have used that real estate for something else if we didn't have to design all of these sophisticated mechanisms to begin with. Okay, as a result, we have this picture that I showed you earlier uh, that is very processor centric. So let me give you the energy perspective very quickly. Also, this is old data that I borrow from Bill Daly in his high peak keynote. Basically, this data shows uh, the cost, energy cost of different operations on a chip or off a chip. You can see that a 64-bit double precision floating point operation consumes 20 picojoules. A DRAM read or write consumes 16 nanojoules. That's about 800x. Okay, basically a memory access consumes between two to three orders of magnitude the energy of a complex addition today. Uh, 800x may be a, a lot. If you optimize it, you can get closer to 100x. 
but it's not easy to get to 100x really because, because we're exercising these very power hungry interconnects. So uh, it's, uh, it's good to ask the question over here. Uh, uh, if you're adding two numbers uh, and we don't have a whole lot of locality to uh, justify caching those numbers, does it really make sense to bring the two numbers uh, and write the result back? Uh, uh, consuming three times two to three orders of magnitude more energy than uh, the amount of energy that it takes to do the computation. And I would argue that the answer should be no over here if we don't want to waste energy. Okay. Uh, I mean, I could also talk about the historical perspective over here, but I'm not going to talk about it. But if, very quickly, if you look back into the history 70 years ago, the picture was exactly opposite. Basically, the comput computation was much more costly than MME access. Why? Because we didn't have 70 years of technology scaling behind us. Because of CMOS technology scaling, computation logic became much, much better, much faster, much more efficient, but the interconnects remained. Interconnects did not scale as well. As a result, we're five orders of magnitude on the other side, meaning uh, interconnects are much worse today. And most of memory is dominated by interconnects today. Okay, so these, there are a lot of other papers that are written on this. And as I mentioned, we did the study with Google where we showed that more than 60% of the total system energy is spent on data movement. So basically, I will argue that we do not want to move data if you want to be high performance, sustainable, and energy efficient. We need a paradigm shift to enable computation with minimal data movement. We need to compute where it makes sense, where data resides, as opposed to just in the processor. And uh, we want to make computing architectures more data-centric as opposed to processor-centric. So memory is a special place. I'm going to talk about processing in or near memory uh, for the rest of the talk. But I think we need to be doing this for everywhere where we store data, it, uh, be it the storage device, be it the tape, be it the network device, uh, be it the sequencer where we sequence uh, our genomes we would like to be able to do computation inside there because where we, where we store the data and where we generate the data because we want to minimize the data movement. I think memory is a special place because we already uh, have lar very large memories that can store a lot of our data in memory databases, in memory graph processing engines, in memory media processing engines, and we would like to be able to take advantage of that. Uh, and we would like to be able to do processing in the caches as well, SRAM or some other type of memory. So basically, uh, to process data inside memory, we'd like to be able to ask questions to memory. Uh, ask memory, can you do this operation for me? And the memory says yes uh, or no. If it says yes, it can return the results. And you can actually communicate with memory as equals, uh, as opposed to processor dominating being the master uh, of memory. So clearly there are many questions over here. How do you design the compute capable memory and the controllers? How do you design the processor chip and in memory units? Software and hardware interfaces to enable this? How do you design the system comp uh, software compilers and languages to make this easier to adopt and to make this general purpose. And on top of this, how do you design the algorithms to fit the computation that goes on in the memory, as well as the theoretical foundations of computing? I'll very briefly talk about that. So this clearly, I don't have answers all of this. Uh, I will talk, uh, talk about some steps that we're taking and that others may be taking. But clearly, in the full form of this problem, it's an algorithm to devices uh, co-design problem that goes all the way from algorithms to devices. As a result, it's very disruptive, in my opinion. And none of the parts should really be ignored in this picture that I have on the right. And I believe that even the theoretical foundations of computing should be really examined, because if you've taken a theoretical computing science, uh, to computer science course, uh, or a theory of computation course, basically the complexity of algorithms today uh, is analyzed by counting operations. The big O notation, for example, is all based on counting how many operations you do on an array, for example. But this is really processor-centric. The thinking is processor-centric. If you really are data-centric, maybe you should not be counting operations that are done in the processor. Maybe you should really be counting something else about memory, uh, like data movement, for example. So I think we really need to re-examine the theoretical foundations in addition to the entire stack. OK, so that said, I think we need to take two uh, approaches uh, going into the future in processing in memory. Uh, I'm sorry, was there a question? OK, I'll continue. That said, I think we need to take different approaches to processing in memory today that then has been taken in the past. In the past, people have looked at, for example, can I put a big hefty out of order processor inside a DRAM chip? I think uh, maybe there's some space for that, but I think it's going to be very, very uh, costly to do those approaches. And I think we need to think differently. So I'm gonna talk about two different options. One is minimally changing memory chips, and the second is exploiting 3D stack memory. And I think both of these options are actually applicable to different technologies. Although I'm going to give you examples from DRAM because I think DRAM still has a 
a good future going into the future, especially if the memory manufacturers change their mindsets and open up uh, more data-centric paradigms. Okay, so I think any memory has great capability to perform bot data movement and computation internally with small changes. Uh, you can exploit internal connectivity to move data inside a memory chip, and you can exploit analog computation capability inside a memory chip. This is true for DRAM, this is true for SRAM, this is true for NVM. I'm gonna give you examples from DRAM over here. And on top of this, you can, you can add more internal connectivity to make things better. You can add more computation capability as well. So I'm gonna give you some examples. I'm gonna start with cheating, meaning I'm not even going to, talk, uh, going to talk about computation. I'm gonna talk about data copy and initialization, which is really important in my opinion, because in our systems, we do a lot of data copy and initialization. My favorite example to this is, okay, you have a database, one terabyte, and you want to initialize it. How long does it take to zero out the memory? It takes a long time, basically. And today, we actually do it through the DMA engine or the processor. And if you don't believe me, again, uh, Google comes to the rescue. Google, in their paper in ISCA 2015, uh, they analyzed all of their workloads, and they basically showed that uh, in all of their data center workloads, uh, approximately 5% of, of all of the execution cycles are consumed by just these two function calls, mem move and mem copy. And I think this is a huge overhead in terms of just these two function calls. This is not all of the data moments clearly, right? This is just these two explicit data moment function calls. Programmers do many, many different types of data moments that are not explicit. Okay, so how do we do bot data copy in our systems today? Uh, before I go into bot data copy, initialization is a very special case of copy. Basically, initialization, you can write data to one a page and you can copy that page to uh, all of the other pages that need to have the same data. But bot data copy is a primitive. Uh, you basically, if you want to copy this white page to this gray page over here, today we go through the processor, or at least the DMA engine. We, we copy the source page byte by byte on, on the, all the way into the L1 cache. We copy the destination page byte by byte all the way into the L1 cache, do the write, and write the result back byte by byte into memory. So clearly this is high latency. This is high bandwidth utilization on perhaps the most important uh, bandwidth constraint part of the system, which is the memory bus. Uh, it caused cache pollution, but you could eliminate that by doing this through the di direct memory access engine here today. It causes a lot of unwanted data moments. For example, if you're not going to use this page anytime soon, you're moving all of this data over here. Today, a four kilobyte a page copy uh, through the DMA engine, not even going through the caches, consumes about 1,000 nanoseconds and 3.6 microjoules. And imagine what happens with a one megabyte or four megabyte copies. So if you gave that picture to a 10-year-old child and asked the question, am I doing something wrong here? Maybe they would tell you, well, why do you go through the processor? Just do it inside memory. And I think sometimes we need to think like a 10-year-old child and overcome a lot of the barriers uh, to uh, simple thinking. Uh, basically, we could actually do this in memory, and that's the proposal. This will be low latency because we're going to not move data uh, as much, and we're going to use the internal connectivity inside memory. This will be low bandwidth utilization. In fact, no bandwidth utilization on this data bus unless you really need the destination page or parts of it. No cache pollution, but you could eliminate that today anyway. And and no unwanted data moments on the most important uh, system resource potential. And I'm going to give you a mechanism that takes us 1,046 nanoseconds to 3.6 microjoules, and uh, uh, no, 1,046 nanoseconds to 90 nanoseconds, and 3.6 microjoules to 0 0.04 microjoules. And you can, you can optimize the system even more, actually, and get even better performance. And the idea is very simple. We call this row clone. It's, it's basically back-to-back -back, back -back activation to enable in DRAM row copy. And other folks have actually shown that you can actually do it in page change memories and other non volatile memories as well. But let me give you the idea in DRAM. Basically, you have this row level, uh, uh, you have these many rows that uh, consist of the DRAM subarray. And if uh, they share a sense amplifier over here, which is very strong, it's also called the row buffer. If you want to copy data from source row A to source row B, we use two steps. For we first activate the source row, which brings the data into the row buffer of the subarray. Now the cells, strong, cells in the row buffer strongly store this data because they're extremely strong compared to the cells in the DRAM array. And the next step is actually activate the destination row. And once we activate the destination row, we implicitly deactivate the source row. Yeah, okay. And this connects the, the row buffer into the destination row. Okay. Uh, sorry, is there a question? Uh, I hear some noise, so. Okay, uh, basically the cells that stored the source uh, data now actually get connected to the destination row as a result, they drive the destination row cells and you basically capture the uh, data in the destination row. So by doing two consecutive activates uh, you can, with negligible hardware cost, you can do this row cloning. You can almost do it in existing DRAM chips. In fact, a recent work 
using our infrastructure and uh, building on our roll call on paper showed that you could do this reliably in many DRAM chips by violating the timing parameters such that you could mimic what I've shown you over here. You, what what, by violating the timing parameters, you're really mimicking back-to-back -back, back -back activates like this over here. And we actually replicated their results and we show that in many DRAM chips by violating the timing parameters, you could do this very reliably. Of course, if you really want to be perfectly reliable, I think you really want to do this uh, as part of your DRAM protocol. Okay, so basically doing so reduces your latency of copy by more than 11x and reduces your memory energy of copy by 74x. And in the paper, we have many more mechanisms to enable this uh, across banks and across different subways. And we have actually better works that are published uh, that improve the performance uh, of a row clone, but I'm not gonna talk about that. Uh, you, you get the basic idea. Uh, okay, so the thinking here is really we're thinking of memory as an accelerator. It's a, it has specialized computation capability, in this case, data movement and initialization capability, but it's really no different from a conventional accelerator. We can offload simple computations to this accelerator, and we know very well how to build all of these sophisticated accelerators, but they all suffer from one thing, which is the fact that they're sitting on the left side of the memory bus over here. Why don't we have some accelerators on the right side of the memory bus such that we can take advantage of the accelerator's uh, close to, closeness to memory? and uh, the low latency, high bandwidth, low energy access uh, to memory structures over here. Okay, similarly to NDRAM copy and zeroing or initialization, we can actually support and or not and majority operations in DRAM. And other works have shown that you could do this in non-volatile memory also. The basic idea is to exploit analog computation capability of DRAM. And the idea is really activating multiple rows at the same time concurrently. And I'm gonna show you the idea very quickly but you can get 30 to 60x performance and energy improvements on these primitive bulk bitwise operations. And the paper that has introduced this is over here. And we actually have earlier papers that have introduced them, but uh, I'm happy to talk about them later. I will mention over here that new memory technologies enable even more opportunities because fundamentally a DRAM read is destructive. Whereas in these other memory technologies have different structures like crossbar structure and also reads are not destructive. So in these memory technologies like memristors, resistive RAM, phase change memory, uh, STTM RAM, you can operate on data with even less uh, movement on data, and you can exploit the uh, crossbar structure of these memory technologies. And there's a lot of work going on in the field related to this that I'm not going to talk about in this work, but I'm going to focus on in DEM, which you can actually do in NVM as well. So let's take a look at what we can do in DEM. Basically, imagine that these are three rows in DEM. I'm showing you only one bit per row and one bit line and one sense amplifier. But imagine that you could do what I'm, I'm going to show you in an eight kilobyte row. And imagine that you could do it concurrently in a thousand subways. So you could do this concurrently in eight million bits, let's say, assuming you can power your DRAM chip, of course. Nothing comes for free. If you're going to do computation in your memory chip, you should actually uh, pay, uh, pay your dues and actually power, uh, be able to power it also. Okay, so if you have the primitive to actually do a triple row of activation, what would happen? You basically connect all these three cells to the bit line. And if at least two of these cells are charged, you get the charge state at the end because of how charge sharing works. And if at least two of these cells are discharged, you would get the discharge state in the end. In this case, two of these cells were charged, you, so you would get VDD on the bit line. So if you actually look at this, this means that you have a bitwise majority function. Now this is great. You can do massively parallel block bitwise majority function, which I think is very interesting. And there are a lot of works that look into Loon logic synthesis uh, you know, using bitwise majority, for example. But you could also realize that by taking out C and setting it to one, you get the OR of A and B. And by, uh, you, uh, if, if you set C to zero, you get the AND of A and B. So you can now do bulk bitwise AND or OR, which is very nice. And you can expose this to your ISA, instruction set architecture. This is one example. I'm not suggesting that this should be the uh, be all and end all example. But basically, there is, an, there is a low cost implementation that you can do, which is described in the paper, so that you, you don't actually increase your area cost significantly. With area cost less than 1% within a DRAM chip, we showed that you can actually do bulk bitwise operations. And you need to take advantage of row clone because DRAM reads are destructive, as I said, uh, so that you can actually preserve the data and do the triple or activation in a special designated region of the subway. Okay, so what's missing here? Basically, clearly AND and OR are good but they're not functionally complete. So to make things functionally or Boolean complete, we wanted to add not. And this requires a little bit more effort uh, that where the cost actually comes from, less than 1% area cost actually comes from using this dual contact cell. The idea is the complement of a cell that you read actually already exists in the other side of the sense amplifier. We want to connect it to a special row. And that's the idea over here. That's the idea of this dual contact cell that I'm not going to talk about, but this paper talks about it. 
And if you actually do that now, your NOT performance is very significant and energy reduction, DM energy reduction is also very significant. And it can build higher level primitives like NAND or XOR, XNOR. And as a result, you get very high bit, bulk bitwise performance. The question is, of course, how, what, benef, uh, what does this benefit? Clearly, applications that are already written to do a lot of bulk bitwise operations benefit a lot, like bitmap indices, database, a lot of, a lot of database in, uh, you know, take advantage of bitmap indices. The bit weaving, some databases are actually written to maximize bitwise operations. Uh, this is Microsoft's BitFunnel engine, which does a web search with similar principles, maximizing bulk bitwise operations. Encryption, DNA sequence mapping, set operations that are covered in the paper. I'm not gonna talk about these in detail. But if your algorithm already is written to take advantage of bulk bitwise operations for some reason, for example, the reason could be you'd like to maximize the throughput in uh, GPUs and the bit weaving database as well as BitFunnel web search engine was written because of that reason. And many databases already uh, use bitmap indices then your application can benefit a lot. But you can, all, you can actually transform a lot of your applications by rethinking your algorithms to this block bitwise operation primitives as well. And we actually have a, a framework that does this uh, today, uh, which I hope I will be able to talk about next year maybe. But if you actually take advantage of uh, AMBIT in these bitmap index based databases, you can actually reduce the query latency for more than 5x as this work demonstrates. We did that in our simulation infrastructure. If you actually take uh, the bit weaving database and perform the queries uh, on AMBIT, uh, our uh, bulk bitwise execution engine, you could get significant performance improvements like 12x in terms of reduce, uh, reducing the query latencies. And you can see that the performance improvement actually increases with the data set sizes, which is a nice property. Of course, at some point it saturates because you're overflowing the DRAM chip. Okay, if you're interested, there's more in these works uh, that introduce AMBIT. And we have recently written uh, with my PhD student who, whose thesis this was part of, uh, a book chapter that talks about India and bot bitwise execution. And it talks about some future directions as well. And as I mentioned, uh, some folks already showed that you could do this in real DRAM chips uh, by uh, essentially uh, violating timing parameters. Uh, they were able to reproduce a row clone as well as bot bitwise operations. They were able to mimic back-to-back uh, -back activations and they were able to mimic, mimic uh, triple row activation. And they showed that you could do this in DRAM chips with some level of reliability. And this, these operations also exist in non-volatile memory chips as this work uh, shows over here. So, okay, let me switch gears a little bit. Uh, there's a lot more to talk about minimally changing memory chips, but I don't have time. Let me talk about an opportunistic approach, which is different from the past, which is exploiting 3D stacked memory. Today, we have 3D stacked memories. The key question is, can we exploit them to uh, do near data processing? And these memories combine tightly a logic layer with many memory layers. And the logic layer has a low latency, high bandwidth, and relatively low energy access to the memory layers. Yeah, through, through, through Silicon VS today, but going into the future, maybe monolithic 3D integration with potentially carbon nanotubes could be very useful going into the future. Okay, uh, let me, uh, so clearly these technologies exist in 3D stacked uh, technologies exist. Some of them are used in three, two and a half D stacked manner today, but there's no reason why they cannot be used in 3D stacked manner. Uh, I think going into the future, these uh, technologies will improve even more. Uh, when we first started doing the research in this area in 2012, we asked two key questions, basically. One is, uh, what kind of performance and energy benefits we can get if we actually had the entire freedom to change the system, such that we could take advantage of these 3D stack devices, and we could use them to accelerate applications? And then we said, okay, if we scale back and just do simple function offloading, we don't change the entire system, what kind of benefits we get. And also, what is the minimal benefit or a minimal crossing in memory support we can provide and what kind of benefit we get if we don't want to actually change the entire system. So I'm gonna quickly go through uh, answers to these questions, but clearly there are no more answers that will be coming into the future. Uh, but I, I want to give you some ideas. So the first question is very important because that gives you the, uh, what could be the benefits of technology going into the future if you had all the freedom in the world? Clearly, it's not adoptable immediately, but there may be some people in the world who may be interested in doing things uh, like what I'm going to describe. So let's take a look at this. Basically, at the time in 2013 or so, we were interested in graph processing, and I think graph processing is very important today, especially in bioinformatics and many other applications that you can see, some of which you can see in this picture. And scalable large-scale graph processing is challenging because if you throw cores at the problem, you don't get speed up, much speed up at least, or commensurate speed up. Basically, the problem is you get a lot of random memory accesses in many graph processing problems, yet little amount of computation. So we designed the system uh, uh, with 3D stack logic and memory chips. Uh, in this case, it was hybrid memory cube, but you can actually use any 3D stack logic plus memory chip 
to design the system. We call this Tesseract. I'm going to give you the very high level strokes of it. You can read this paper for more detail. And this is clearly an entire system design uh, problem. So there's a lot of detail also. also. The idea is to start with a 3D stacked, uh, let's, get, let's, go, let's call it a cube, uh, cube chip. Uh, in, in, in this cube, you have volts and each, it's partitioned to volts. And each volt has a, a DRAM controller that controls the memory on top of it. And we basically add simple in-order cores to these volts, and the volts can communicate with each other with some sort of network. Now, uh, what we do is, if we want to operate on a graph node, the graph node stays allocated on uh, one of the memory layers, and it belongs to that vault. And if anyone wants to update that graph node, they need to send a message to the core that houses the node. So we don't move the graph nodes. Uh, the updates to the graph nodes are performed by the core that's local. Uh, to those graph nodes and data never moves, just computation and intermediate results move. So basically, this is fun. This is uh, the cores communicate with each other using remote function calls. Whenever one core wants to update another core's data, it sends a remote function call, and that remote function call gets queued in the message queue over here. And it gets executed by the core to update the data. Of course, a, sim a single cube is not enough. If you want to have do a large scale graph processing, you need to scale up the system, meaning you need to add many, many more cubes to it. Of course, if you can do this in a stacking manner, that's a good idea. But at the, at the time, we didn't have good enough stacking technologies. Maybe going into the future, monolithic technologies will enable you to grow in a 3D manner. So we had to grow in a 2D manner over here. And you need to lay out your graphs nicely, such that you can maximize locality within a vault as much as possible and within a cube as much as possible. And you would like to avoid crossing the cubes whenever you do remote function calls as much as possible to minimize data movement clearly. So this is a message passing system. Communications are done via very much faction calls. And we do prefetching to maximize the bandwidth efficiently also. I'm not going to talk about this. You can read the paper. But clearly, this is a memory-centric system because it looks like this, as you can see. It doesn't have the processor memory dichotomy on the baseline systems that we're going to compare to. So the baseline systems are DDR3 and hybrid memory cube systems with different types of cores over here. And you can see that we can expose, at the time, 8 terabytes per second memory bandwidth to our 512 in-order cores in uh, 32 cubes over here. Let me give you the results very quickly. There are a lot, of more, a lot more results in the paper, but the takeaway is we get significant performance improvement, more than an order of magnitude performance improvement end-to-end -end on five graph processing algorithms averaged. So later works actually improved this number. There are a lot of works that uh, show that you could do graph partitioning better, you could do load balancing better, you could do a scheduling of the threads uh, or, or function calls better. And as a result, you can get around two orders of magnitude today. And I'd be happy to talk about those works if people are interested. Uh, OK, basically, you get significant energy reduction as well. At the time we finished the work, it was 8x energy reduction, even not counting for the baseline course. And later works, again, as I said, improved. And they showed that you could get closer to two orders of magnitude energy reduction on real end-to-end uh, uh, -end graph processing algorithms. OK, I'm not going to talk more about Tesseract. That's Tesseract. Clearly, this is changing a lot in the system. Let's be a little bit more realistic or more adaptable, let's say. And let's say uh, what happens, let's see what happens if you can actually do simple functional flow. I'm uh, going to talk about one paper related to this. Uh, hello? Leonard, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear. Yeah, uh, how about uh, try to wrap it up in uh, no more than 10, uh, 10, 12, 10. This is 12. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that, sound, that sounds good, actually. In 10 minutes, I can wrap it up. I'll just cover these relatively quickly. And I'm not going to cover the other two directions, as I mentioned earlier. Thank you. OK, so I'm going to talk about this work quickly. Uh, basically, uh, we were very interested in consumer devices over here. And clearly, energy is a big problem. And we worked with Google over the course of one and a half years to analyze some key workloads, uh, some of which we're actually using right now whenever we do the video conferencing. Uh, and clearly, many of us use all of these, I believe. Uh, and we wanted to understand the energy cost of data moment in these workloads and real systems. And we found out that more than 60% of the energy is spent on data moment across the memory hierarchy in these mobile workloads. And, one and we wanted to examine processing in memory in 3D stack memories to understand uh, the potential of moving computation close to data in a more realistic fashion. And uh, the challenge is limited area energy budget. And we actually take into account all of those in this work. So the second key observation that enabled us to do this relatively easily, let's say, uh, is uh, data movement often comes from simple functions in many workloads. I'm going to give you examples of these simple functions. But you can execute, you can, once you identify these simple functions, you can execute them in small embedded low power cores or small fixed function accelerators or a combination of them. And I believe even reconfigurable logic near memory in the logic layer as well. 
And the key takeaway is if you actually identify the functions nicely, as my PhD student Amirali did in this work, uh, you can improve performance by 2x and reduce energy by 2x. That's the translation of these numbers over here for you. Let me give you very quickly some functions. If you know TensorFlow, it does uh, machine learning inference at the edge on your cell phone, for example. And we found out that a significant fraction of its energy is spent on data moment, and two functions are responsible for a significant fraction of the data moment packing and unpacking of data and quantization of data. I'm not going to talk about this, but many uh, machine learning accelerators do this also. They basically reorder elements to take advantage of the sparsity uh, of the matrix, and they basically do the computation after some sort of reordering. And this reordering is packing and unpacking, and it's a simple process that requires simple arithmetic, and this can be relatively easily offloadable to uh, a near memory computing unit. Quantization is done in almost all neural networks today, especially if you're very much energy constrained. And this is also a simple data conversion operation that requires very simple operations, as you can see. And you can see that there are some other functions that we offloaded, compression, decompression, texture tiling, color billeting. And you can see in video playback and capture in motion estimation is another example. But basically, if you identify these functions, you can do relatively simple offloading that doesn't need to change the existing model significantly. You don't need to get rid of, uh, for example, virtual memory. You don't need to get rid of uh, existing programming paradigms. OK, if you're interested, you can read the paper for more. And we do a lot of other works I'm not going to talk about. You could actually accelerate GPU execution with function offloading. And uh, you can also build accelerators that can offload uh, pointer chasing type of functions, which are very difficult to improve otherwise. And uh, there are also automated ways uh, we have been exploring uh, to improve prefetching as well by offloading them. And recently, we actually are very interested in looking at high bandwidth memory uh, using uh, FPGAs that are capable of high bandwidth memory. And you can see some of the work that we're doing in this area. And this is the work that I mentioned that, uh, that uh, designs a near data processing engine for approximate string matching. And these are all examples of hardware software co-design for function offloading or a, more, um, a, a, large, a large amount of function offloading, let's say. And we're also very interested in time series analysis, as you can see in this work. Let me quickly talk about this minimal support because it leads into adoption issues. And after the adoption issues, I'm going to conclude relatively quickly. But basically, it's, it's very important to be cognizant about adoption issues, I think. And we also wanted to look at uh, what can we do that's minimally intrusive to the system to take advantage of 3D stacked memory. And we, we wanted to have minimal cost, minimal changes to the system, and no changes to the programming model. And if you, these are your constraints, I think the idea may be obvious in the end. Uh, you basically in, introduce these PIM operations as simple uh, host processor instructions that operate only on a single cache block. This part is important so that the cache block doesn't get, so that your data doesn't get distributed across memory modules. So if you do this, you're, you can basically program using PIM add pragmas, for example, or the compiler can figure these out. You don't have any changes to sequential model. You don't have any changes to virtual memory, very minimal change to cache coherence, and there's no need for data mapping, careful data mapping, because the operation is restricted to a single memory module. And we also dynamically decide where to execute each operation. Should it be executed in the processor? Should it be executed in the memory side? I'm not going to go through the details. You can read the paper. But these are some example operations that we found are useful. Dot product, for example, clearly is important for uh, machine learning applications. Euclidean distance is very important for time series analysis or streaming clustering, histogram bit indexing, hash table probing, et cetera. You can see floating point out, out also. And uh, I believe, actually, a reconfigurable logic uh, that is customizable uh, dynamically uh, can be very helpful for identification and execution of this sort of operations near memory. Okay, I'm going to skip these, but I'll give you the basic results. The takeaway is you don't gain 13x, you don't gain 2x, you get about 50% performance improvement and 25% energy reduction. So it's not bad, but it's not uh, as good as what you would do if you were more aggressive. So I think this is a good adoption uh, example of processing in memory, and I think going forward we need to consider uh, the entire spectrum in processing in memory. Uh, what happens if we change the entire system? Whatever, what happens if we change uh, small parts of the system? So that brings me to the adoption issues. I think there are many adoption issues to a paradigm change like this. And a lot of them are functionality, software applications, easing the life of the programmer, easing the life of the programmer through system support, coherence, and virtual memory. Uh, again, easing the life of the system designer and the programmer and make, taking advantage of the system by doing better runtime and compilation systems and enabling better security and uh, enabling better infrastructures to assess benefits and feasibility. So clearly there are a lot of adoption issues, but I believe all change, all, all can be solved with a change of mindset. For example, if we can implement row clone, there will be people who will take advantage of it. In fact, if we can implement PIM enabled instructions, there will be people who will take advantage of it. In the end, I believe to, ena to enable the full paradigm, 
we need to revisit the entire stack. We need to do an algorithm to code, device co-design. But I believe we can get there step by step. And if you're interested, we've actually pa written papers uh, about this that talks about a lot of the issues, uh, both uh, from these many perspectives, but also from a workload and programming East German perspective also. Uh, very quickly, there's also uh, companies who are working on this. As you can see, we're working with the UPMAM company who is based in Grenoble in France. And these folks have put uh, in DRAM chips uh, what, what they call DRAM processing units. And each DRAM processing unit is associated with a bank and it can access the data and operate on the data uh, in that bank very, very quickly at low latency, at low energy and high bandwidth. So they're actually really good results that we have in some of their systems and these chips are already produced. Okay, so this is a positive for going into the future. So I'm gonna skip these slides and then go to the conclusion slide. If you're really interested, these slides are already available and actually a longer version of this talk is already available online as well. Uh, but let me conclude over here. Oh, yeah, there are a lot of slides. <laughs> okay, uh, so I believe uh, it's time to design principled system architectures to solve the data handling problem, which manifests itself as a memory and storage problem. We want to design complete systems to be truly balanced, high performance, energy efficient, which is, I believe, important for intelligent architectures. And I think we need to exploit three principles, data-centric, data-driven, and data-aware. I didn't talk about data-driven and data-aware, but I give you uh, an idea of what they might be. But data-centric is also critical. And I believe these three go hand in hand if we design uh, systems. We need to enable computation capability inside and close to memory. And I believe this can enable orders of magnitude improvements, as I've shown you examples of, enable new application and computing platforms, like a genomics application that can do genomics analyses uh, within real time, let's say enable better understanding of nature, which we have not been very successful about uh, recently because of the way we design computers, I think, and who knows what else. Okay, and I think we need to find new principles also. I don't believe nature operates in a processor-centric way. It's much more data-centric and who knows what else. I don't claim to know everything. But as I said, we need to revisit the entire stack, but we can get there step by step. And these are some good principles that I mentioned in this talk. Uh, there may be more, but most of most of everything else, I think we, we really need open minds going into the future. We cannot reject ideas because I see the processor-centric paradigm dominating uh, a lot of what we do, including the theoretical foundations of computing. Okay, at this point, I will acknowledge people who have funded us and please keep funding us and acknowledge my group and collaborators who have uh, contributed to all of the work that I mentioned over here. If you're interested, there's more in our newsletter that's relatively old right now. And I'd be happy to take questions at this point. Thank you. Okay, thank you. It's hard to hear all the claps uh, on the background. Uh, I, uh, so thanks, thanks a lot, Owner, for this wonderful content-rich, you know, stuff-packed uh, talk. Uh, like uh, Owner said, he, uh, this talk will be, it's recorded, so we'll publish it later on YouTube. And uh, Owner will also share the slides with us, right, Owner? Sure, yeah, of course. I'll yeah. send the slides to you after this. So now I'm open the floor for questions and you can raise your hands. Can, or... I, can I have one, one question? Yes, uh, so let okay. me just... uh, people, hold, hold on. Uh, you can either raise your hands or uh, type your questions on chat and I will call you. Uh, okay. Your, uh, so okay. that uh, organize. Sorry, sorry for... Right now, uh, I, I'm... Hold, is it the Yongsu? Yes, I'm Yongsu Guan, uh, actually from, from Republic of Korea. Uh, I have just two questions. Uh, my first question is about the exact definition of uh, processing memory. Uh, when you see, uh, you said that the uh, architecture of uh, UPMEMS DRAM is uh, an example of uh, industrial example of uh, PIM, but uh, someone, I, I saw someone said that that is just, uh, I mean, it, it, he was uh, devaluing uh, the, the output of, uh, output of their uh, memory structure. They were saying that it was just uh, processing near memory. In other words, uh, the, it was just the offloading of uh, a workload which should be executed in the main host processor to the memory. Mm -hmm. So. What I can see that is that uh, you have you have uh, been talking about the architecture in the first first part of the talk and the last part of the talk you are also talking about the bitwise um, what is that bulkwise 
uh, bulk bitwise operations in the embedded DRAM. So I can see the clear separation between two technologies. So the first one is that the architectural uh, redefinition of uh, redefinition of architecture uh, so that it can be the processing near memory. We just move the uh, uh, digital logic to near to the memory inside of chip. And the second one is the, uh, the, the bulk, bulk bitwise operations that you just said and the, the architecture that we have seen the, in the last presentation from uh, by the Kausik, Kausik Loy. Uh, he was also saying that uh, he was uh, adding some transistors to the embedded in, in SRAM to do some kind of uh, logical operations. So what uh, can you say that the processing near memory by the digital logic can be the processing in memory? And, and my second question is that for the bulk bitwise operations, has, has, has it been ever implemented on, in the real chip? As far as I know, the, the DRAM technology is not available for, I mean, because uh, only several companies are designing the DRAM these days. So I think it is really hard to implement those kind of logic in the real chip. Okay. So that's my, that's my uh, second question. Okay, thank you for the question. So let me handle the first one. I don't want to go into a religious debate in terms of processing in memory. So if you read our papers that I mentioned, we, we say we call everything processing in memory and we categorize it into two uh, things. One is processing using memory. So this is uh, Ambit type of operations or NVM type of uh, operations that are done in NVM uh, that does, for example, analog operations. We call that processing using memory. You're really using the analog properties of memory to do computation. Uh, Ambit is one example of this, uh, as I mentioned. Pinatubo is another example uh, that I also mentioned. Uh, the other one uh, uh, we call uh, uh, processing in the logic layer as processing near memory, as you also mentioned. Uh, but I think processing in memory is a term that has been used for both in the literature starting from uh, the late 1960s, 1970s, and we don't want to rename that one. I think processing in memory is a general approach of doing stuff <laughs> in, in a memory chip, let's say, or closer to a memory chip. Uh, and again, uh, if you, if you think about these, I think these are uh, 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 options of how, to, how close do you get uh, to the data itself. So today's processors are far away from the data. Uh, caches are also far away from the data. You could do actually have a logic uh, doing operations near the caches, similar to 3D stack memory, or you could do bulk bitwise operations inside the caches. And I think if you do bulk bitwise operations, you get closer to the data as well. Uh, so from that perspective, I think well, I consider all of them as processing in memory, and I think all of them are useful to some extent. In my opinion, we will need to adopt uh, different types of them in our future devices because we cannot do everything, in my opinion, uh, processing using memory. Uh, using memory, memory analog, analog operations in memory are good at some type of things like bulk bitwise operations over here uh, or uh, some crossbar type of operations in non-volatile memory, uh, but they're not good at everything. So you will need to augment it, in my opinion, with near memory processing engines. And I agree that uh, processing using memory changes the paradigm a lot more uh, than processing near memory, because with processing near memory, you're really treating uh, things, uh, processing units near memory as accelerators. Uh, but I think processing using memory can be treated that way also if you're uh, good at uh, hiding the abstractions that are underneath. But that's a, that's a good question. Uh, and I recommend uh, reading our uh, papers that actually have this distinction. The, uh, the paper that we published in IBM Journal of Research and Development, I'll actually mention this over here uh, very quickly, uh, that has that distinction, uh, this one uh, over here. And I think it's good to clarify it. Uh, the second question that you have is also very good. Has anyone implemented AMBIT? Uh, I mean, to my knowledge, uh, no, but uh, I, I also cannot really talk about everything. Uh, but uh, I don't believe that these operations are uh, as difficult as uh, people may think uh, they are. So let me actually, I don't know why I cannot do it. Uh, let me actually go to this work that I mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, this work, uh, the Compute DRAM works, the uh, work that I mentioned that was published in Micro 2019. Uh, okay, here. 
uh, this work basically used our soft MC infrastructure, infrastructure that I introduced earlier. And they, what they did was they violated the timing parameters uh, in a DRAM chip. And they showed that they could do row clone reliably uh, because by violating the timing parameters, they were able to fool the DRAM chip to do back-to-back -back activates to two rows in the same subarray. And they also were able to show in some DRAM chips, they were able to fool the DRAM chip to essentially do a triple row activation like AMBIT does. And they were able to get bitwise AND and bitwise OR. And I, I'm going to say that these are off-the-shelf DRAM chips. These DRAM chips are not designed at all for this purpose. They were able to fool the DRAM chip to do a bitwise AND and bitwise OR. Now, I think if people are actually changing the mindset a little bit and they actually go and design these DRAM chips uh, such that from the ground up, you could do bitwise operations, I don't believe that they're going to be that difficult because if you can do it in an off-the-shelf DRAM chip that's not designed for that purpose, then in my opinion, we are creative enough to make it work uh, if you're designing it from the ground up. Thank you, okay. Lunar. So uh, Thank you. quite a few people sure. raising hands or text uh, putting some private chat in, uh, in, my, in my chat room. Uh, so let me just call on the next question. Uh, JP Wang. Thank you, Sharon. Yeah. This is Jinping, uh, Jinping Wang from University of Minnesota. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Yeah, it's a lot, a lot of information. Uh, I learned a lot. Also, thanks for the organizer. Uh, actually, part of my question already been addressed, uh, you know, when you reply, uh, uh, response to the first question, but I still want to be more specific. So the definition of uh, processing in memory, I, I agree in your, you know, paper, review paper is uh, it st start to become more clear, but still there's some confusion and uh, we need to look into that as the whole community, for example, right? So the crossbar, you know, kind of like using memory to the computing, but those kind of things is not random access, right? So I defined, for example, I want to hear from you, you know, if you want to the computing, you need to be able to randomly access those uh, memory cell and then do the computing. And now you get a chance to load the, sample, load the data and transfer the data from whatever place you do. For example, like MRAM, right? So we talk about the uh, STT MRAM, and now we can build up STT MRAM, this random access, and now we can do the computing inside the STT MRAM. And then in that sense, we, we have a term called a computational random access memory, CRAM. So I, I don't think this community paid too much attention to this, but this totally, after I listen to your talk, I see there's a, you know, there's a very good opportunity if this community can pick up this concept and then implement to some of the things, the energy consumption be tremendous reduced. By the way, my colleague, Professor Sachin Sabanaka and Wulia, they are the real expert on those architecture. Very glad, recommend, you know, you can talk to him too, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, certainly there are different types of uh, uh, comp computation using memory, let's say. I, I agree, some of, the, some of the computation using memory uh, may not be as general purpose, right? Because you don't have random, exactly, you may not have random exactly, access. Yeah. I agree. Uh, and there, we should there, look into there this. Be, you know, for example, if you don't have random access, and then you still argue about computing in memory, using memory, and then you not go to the general purpose, right? So, and then if you not go to general purpose, you will see a lot of limit when you compete with other technology, right? So that's so, my point. So, yeah, yeah, I think I think that's possible. I agree. I, I'm I'm a little bit less concerned. I think uh, all of these uh, the, your your point is uh, well taken. No question about that. Yeah. Uh, but I think all of uh, I I don't see all of these uh, computing in memory engines as necessarily replacing uh, the general purpose engine. They may yeah. be actually augmenting. Uh, for example, uh, I think in DM bot bitwise execution engine, for example, is general purpose because you can do random access in it. But yes, some of the crossbar type of uh, matrix multiplication engines may not be very general purpose, as I also mentioned. Uh, but I think they could also be used as accelerators. I agree. Uh, yeah, maybe there's a better terminology that needs to be developed that uh, further distinguishes uh, the different types of categories uh, within processing using memory and processing near memory. Uh, but there's more work to be done, no question about that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Which is great. Why, uh, where this workshop to include more <laughs> options into our e table. Yeah, yeah. So let me move on to Jeff Vetter. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Jeffrey. Yes. Hi, Jeff. 
Yes. Hi, Owner. A great talk. Um, I just my question was a tangential question focusing on programming models. And so, you know, in DOE and places like that where we have hundreds of applications and thousands of users, we're always interested in what promising approaches would be for programming models for systems like this. And I know you're not really working in that area, but but do you have a couple promising approaches that may be automated or, or kind of an open CL kernel like offload that people would use for PIM? Kind of what what, your, what are your thoughts there? Thank you. Yeah, I think that, that's a great question. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I think that's a very important uh, problem. I mean, clearly, uh, the programming models need to be developed. Uh, I think function offloading uh, could be relatively easy if you're, if you're thinking about processing near memory. Uh, that, that could, I think that's very much compatible with OpenCL type of models if you, if you can identify functions to be offloaded. In fact, we have a work coming up in NextSig Metrics uh, where we analyze more than 400 applications and uh, we, we wanted to understand which functions should be offloaded to memory and we're developing a more uh, automated methodology uh, to enable this at this point. Uh, but I think functional floating is probably the easiest one, uh, but I, I believe uh, other types of processing in memory can be automated also. For example, uh, we have some work uh, going on uh, on this India and bulk bitwise execution engine uh, by building on the primitives uh, that are exposed. Uh, you, you can actually uh, translate applications, algorithms, uh, to those primitives. Uh, and again, uh, I, 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 since we don't have the full work done, uh, uh, I believe there's a good potential for it, uh, but I'd be happy to talk about this also. As I said, I think this is a critical area and there needs to be, in my opinion, uh, more folks in the, who are experts in programming languages uh, looking into uh, this topic to bridge the gap between applications and algorithms to, uh, 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 application and algorithms uh, to bridge the gap between applications algorithms and the underlying in-memory computation uh, uh, paradigms, let's say. You're good, thank yeah. you. Sure, yeah, you're welcome. Definitely, definitely consider uh, uh, submitting a white paper to our workshop. So uh, that's uh, an important topic to discuss. I'm going to have the last question um, from Ramtin Zand. Yes, it's Ramtin Zand. Yes, from the University of South Carolina. Uh, I appreciate your talk, it was amazing. And also the organizers, the workshop organizers, uh, it's a very amazing opportunity for uh, processing and memory enthusiasts and researchers. Um, while there were many interesting things in the talk, I'm more interested in the part that you were discussing leveraging the analog behavior within the DRAM cells to implement some basic logic because I Thing it's getting closer to actually doing process in the memory. Uh, it was around slide 93 to 96 that you mentioned something about the size of the memory. Some numbers are around, if I recall correctly, it was eight kilobytes or kilobits. And within one column that we can do the process, uh, I just wanted to make sure those numbers are right. And then I have some follow-up questions. Yeah. Very so, short uh, questions. Uh, what, I, what I mentioned, it was on this slide actually. Uh, basically, I mentioned that uh, you could do this operation on an eight kilobyte row or three rows in this case. Okay. Uh, and, yeah. and assuming that you can power up uh, a DRAM chip has a, a thousand subarrays, let's say, then you can do everything on eight uh, million, uh, eight megabytes, let's say. That would be amazing. So I have the follow-up question I have here is how concerned you are about the parasitics effects when you're turning on these long lines, have you seen any results that, and what clock frequencies are we talking about? Because I assume that it's gonna affect that frequencies as well, right? Yeah, so I, I will refer you to our paper. We did a lot of circuit simulations, spice simulations, and uh, uh, of course there are some parasitic effects. There's a lot of variation. Uh, and if, if the variation becomes too much, this becomes more approximate. Uh, if the variation is more, on, more or less under control, or if you can design a special area, in the DRAM chip, uh, that's slightly better, then you can keep it more under control. But in the, in the paper, you can take a look at it. That's but in, uh, internally, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I think I, I, I'll probably refer you to the paper because all of your detailed questions are answered in the paper. So, but just a quick answer is that you're not that concerned about that, you know, the pr in practice, we, we are able to do that, right? Uh, so, okay, uh, I, I believe with, with, with good design, uh, we can we can do it. Yes, you need to control some things uh, in a good way. 
Uh, but I think with good design, we should be able to it. And as I mentioned, there's a proof of concept uh, that does it with some level of reliability, even though the chip is not designed to do it, right? Okay, amazing. Yeah, thank you very much, because that, that's a great help. We can have eight kilobyte. Thanks. I appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Okay, uh, I think in the interest of time, I hate to uh, cut this short. I know there's some more questions. I'm sure you can find a way to reach out to honor to Professor Matlu and see if you can get your answer, uh, questions answered that way. Uh, Besides that, I think I'm going to stop the uh, seminar here and I will ask you, ask us all of us to thank uh, Professor Matlu again. If you can treat, uh, do your reactions, you can do you clap your hands. Um, yeah, so thank with, you. Yeah, with that, I ask you to stay tuned for our next pilot talk, which we will announce uh, in the next uh, few weeks. And, and then wish you all have a great day, a great evening. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, bye. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Wonderful. Bye bye. Bye bye.